Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Elaine Amir, president of the Haberman Institute for Jewish Studies Board of Directors. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone joining us today from our local community in the DC metro area here in this beautiful sanctuary of Temple Beth Ami and to so many more joining us from across North America and beyond online. There are some 300 of you uh, today who are tuning into our program. Today's a very significant day for the Haberman Institute. We welcome Rabbi Jack Luxemburg of Temple Beth Ami to present the first lecture that our institute is offering in memory of our friend and colleague, Avi West who passed away in August of last year. He left behind his wonderful wife, Hagit, a daughter, Leon, and a son, Yochai, and several grandchildren. Avi was a member of the Haberman Institute's board of directors for five years, but he was a mentor to thousands of teachers and learners throughout the Jewish community throughout his entire life. Avi was the go-to person for innovative ways to engage audiences with the learning of texts and other instruments of Jewish learning. One colleague from the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington, where Avi was senior education officer and master teacher, described Avi as one of a kind, a traditional Jew with an untraditional approach to Judaism, a teacher to all and a student of everything. Another colleague described Avi's approach to Judaism and Jewish education as joyful and electric, and there couldn't be a better description of Avi than that. Everyone appreciated Avi's incredible sense of humor he was a master of the pun, and he could pun in four languages. He was brilliant, said one friend. He had an amazing command of the Jewish texts, but more importantly, he taught us how to apply them, how to make Judaism come alive for people. That was so obvious. And so today, we honor the memory of this extraordinary man with a special lecture by Rabbi Jack Luxemburg, a beloved colleague of Avi's, who, like Avi, has always brought new meaning to our holiday celebrations. Avi used to love to, to give lectures on the various holidays, and it was always something that you never thought about and never knew. Uh, it was always new ways. He was a man of innovation. But before I introduce Rabbi Luxemburg, I invite you to learn more about the Haberman Institute's programs and classes by visiting our website, habermaninstitute.org. Our next program is coming up on June 12, a reimagined day of learning on dangers of Maimonides with Dr. Joel Hecker, professor of Jewish mysticism. Join us online for two sessions delving into this fascinating topic. Today's program is titled Revelation and Remembrance, Recapturing the Echoes of Sinai. Our Rabbi uh, Jack Luxemburg, who's our, our speaker is Rabbi Jack Luxemburg, who served this beautiful Temple Beth Ami community a senior rabbi for 35 years before taking America, emeritus status in 2016. And here we are in the actual sanctuary of Temple Beth Ami. Throughout his years in the DC metro community, Rabbi Luxemburg has been active in local and national organizations, including the American Jewish Congress, the Association of Reform Zionists in America, the Jewish Federations of North America, and the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington, among others. He has taught at the community and university levels and at gatherings in both Israel and Europe. Rabbi Luxemburg holds a Doctor of Ministry degree from Wesleyan, from Wesley Theological Seminary, as well as a Master of Arts of Hebrew Letters and a Doctor of Hebrew Letters honoris causa 
from the Hebrew Union College. Rabbi Luxembourg is delivering the first lecture that the Haberman Institute is dedicating to the life and accomplishments of his colleague, friend, and teacher, Avi West. Rabbi Luxembourg, it's your turn. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Elaine, for the generous introduction and the kind remembrance of Avi. Uh, to those of you who are here in the sanctuary, Kuchim Habayim, to those of you who are here at Bethany for the first time, I'd like to extend you a special warm welcome. To those of you who are joining us uh, online, uh, welcome in to this, our congregational home. And I'd like to say uh, to Hagit, Liran and Yochai, uh, thank you uh, for this privilege of teaching in the name of my uh, friend and colleague from whom I too learned so very, very much. Uh, and for those of you who are taking advantage of the fact that this is a lunchtime presentation, Beteavon. <laughs> uh, the rabbis um, warn us uh, about uh, having the temerity uh, teach, to teach in the presence of your own teachers. And among those who are seated in the sanctuary were those with whom I have studied Torah for over three decades and from whom I have learned much. And certainly it's true for many of you who are online, those whom I know and those whom I don't know. Uh, I'm sure there are many who exceed me in learning. I learned long ago that being a rap pulpit rabbi in Washington means that wherever you talk and about whatever you're talking about, there's always someone who's listening to you who knows more about what you're speaking about than you do. Uh, I always keep in mind the Misa about the, uh, the man who survived the Jonestown flood, whose anniversary actually was yesterday, who at the end of his life, after having spent it as a platform speaker talking about having to survive the great disaster, ascends to the high heavens where he is invited to speak to the heavenly host and introduce himself. And the angels ask him, what would you like to speak about? And he says, well, I've made my life uh, talking about surviving the Jonestown flood. The angel asks, um, you have another topic? <laughs> he says, no, I mean, it's, 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 it's what I'm about. I survived the Jonestown flood. I'm, but one of a handful of survivors who can give account of what it means to, this, to, to have survived such a deluge. The angel nods and says, okay, just remember that Noah is in the audience. <laughs> so with, uh, with the permission of all the Noahs who are in our audience here and abroad, uh, thank you for the privilege of teaching. Um, I entitled this presentation Revelation and Remembrance uh, because that is what uh, the coming Chag of Shavuot is really about and is also the challenge of a Chag. How do you remember? How do you recall? How do you even to the slightest degree uh, dip our uh, spiritual consciousness into the significance of the moment of Sinai? Now today is the 46th day of the Omer, and according to one Omer calendar, of which there are many, uh, the first of Psalms that is associated with this day is so very, very important. It says, uh, it is, uh, It's doubly appropriate this morning that it brings together so many of us because it is also a reflection of one of Avi's great virtues and an important lesson of his Torah, his powerful sense of community and inclusion, bringing us together through his love of Judaism in all its different expressions, and for the Jewish people in all our diversity. So Shavuot, like so many of uh, all our regalim, Shavuot has two aspects. It reflects the seasonal agricultural rhythms of the land of Israel, and it is associated with a particular experience in the spiritual history of the people of Israel. So let's examine these two aspects of Shavuot together and how they 
speak to one another, if at all. Since we will be studying text, as you heard was Avi's uh, inclination, as he introduced very popular and accessible insights into our Chagim, a project which I was privileged to participate in with him, I'd like to begin with the bracha for the study of Torah, and I would like to conclude our session this, e this afternoon with, later with Kaddish to Rabbanan, uh, in honor of our study time together and in honor of Avi's Torah. Here or out there, please join me. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Asher Kitchanu Bamitzvotav Bitzivanu, Vasot Bidivre Torah. And you'll forgive me that the Hebrew doesn't always uh, commute between sources uh, in, in the right order. We're going to bump into that occasionally from time to time. My, uh, my capacity for the PowerPoint, the art of PowerPoint is but limited. So uh, let's take a look at, to see what the Torah says about Shavuot. How does the Torah present to us these two aspects of the Chag? Well, first, uh, we have Vasita Chag HaShavuot. We have, we're going to have a festival uh, that is pr primarily founded on the counting of weeks, seven, a week of weeks, seven times seven, 49 days. And during those 49 days, we're going to be counting Omer. We're going to be bringing in the harvest, and we'll be going, hopefully counting in upon, uh, the abundance uh, of a harvest, which is going to carry us through the spring, through the hot summer, and to the next harvest time, which is months and months away at Sukkot. This is an important time. And I'm sure our ancestors counted every bushel, every omer worth of grain very, very carefully to know what the future would hold for them. So we have Chag HaShvuot, a week of weeks, and not only of uh, 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 as a recollection of the journey, right, the 49 days from Egypt to Sinai, not only a geographical journey, but for many of us, a spiritual and, and ethical journey. Uh, we participate in the discipline of preparation and anticipation of Shavuot by having this be a, four, uh, a structured 49-day period of, of study and learning. Well, this is also Chag HaKetzir. This is the Feast of the Harvest, where our ancestors are working hard in the fields. They're bringing in, uh, bringing in the grain. It's also Yom Habikurim or Chag Habikurim is the day of the first fruits. And what do we do with those first fruits? We bring them up to celebrate the abundance of the harvest. We bring it up to Yerushalayim, to Jerusalem. They're to be offered in do in, 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 as donation and sacrifice uh, in, the, in the temple. Interestingly, Shavuot is referenced six times in the Torah. And each reference focuses on the agricultural rhythms of the land of Israel and with the associated rituals and celebrations that took place there. No mention of Sinai. No mention of Matan Torah. When did it change? you know when it changed, and you know why it had to change. We were without a land, and in the places to which we were dispersed, we were often prohibited from owning land. We had no temple. We, our ancestors exiled from Yerushalayim. No temple to bring Bikurim. What were we to do? How were we to celebrate this Chag in any meaningful way. And so the rabbis, as they did so often, they embarked on a, they embarked on a remarkable transformation. This is their genius. Uh, this, is, this is what Max DeMont referred to uh, in his book uh, as lifeboat Judaism. How do you save the people? How do you save Judaism? 
when the great vessel uh, 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 of the spiritual enterprise of our folk, the land of Israel, the temple in Jerusalem, was no longer available, sunk beneath the waves of destruction in history. What do you do? There is, uh, this alone is worth, a, I think, a discussion, this process. But let us just note that the genius of turning, doing a 180 degree pivot, a 180 degree pivot, and turning this into um, uh, shifting the focus to Matan Torah. In fact, one of the earliest passages in this regard is found in, in, in the Exodus Rabbah. It's attributed to Rabbi Meir, where he makes mention of the festival of the harvest, Chaka Katsir, on which Torah was given to Israel. In his comment, he makes the link, and this is one of the very earliest associations and the linkages. But it's now not just a link, it's a transference. We're going from Chag HaKatsir, Chag HaBikurim. We're going to Chag HaShvuot, Zaman Matan Toratenu. In fact, if we look at the Sidur into prayers that are included to celebrate and to acknowledge the Chag, the example here is the Alevi Avlo. It's not Chag HaBikurim, it's not Chag HaKatsir. We ask for goodness, we ask for well-being, we ask for deliverance on this day of Chag HaShvuot, Zman Matan Toratin. The transition has become complete. Not that the echoes, as I'm going to try to suggest, have been lost, but they become a challenge to preserve. And note also how this prayer is in itself a remembrance. May the remembrance of our ancestors come before you. The, remember the Mashiach of the house of David. Now remember Mashiach is not just an individual. Mashiach represents what? Re represents ret the return to the land and the restoration of the sovereignty and the rebuilding of the temple and the restoration of the sacrificial worship. And the house of David, another symbol of Jewish sovereignty and, 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 and independence. And by the way, the association of David with Shavuot is very strong because it's, tradition has it that King David died on Shavuot. Jerusalem, your holy city to which we made pilgrimage. So even as we talk about Shavuot, it's man matan Tauratenu, even as we've made this transition, our tefillah asks us to remember all the other associated uh, themes and ideas. So there is a challenge now. There's a challenge that comes with this transition. How do you celebrate? How do you recall? How do you remember and revisit the moment of revelation at Sinai? Our rituals at Passover and at Sukkot enable us to bring those events of the past into the present and make them part of our lives. But how do you do that with Sinai? We reenact Yitzhak Mitzrayim around our Seder tables. And we say that in every generation is incumbent upon every individual that we see ourselves as having been redeemed. We bring the moment into our present lives. We do the same with the rituals and customs that build of Sukkot and building the Sukkah. We remember Yitzhak Mitzrayim, we remember the fragile dwellings of our ancestors. We join them on the journey and we make it ours. How do you do that with Revelation at Sinai? How do you reenact theophany, an encounter with a deity that is an event where the manifestation of the deity occurs in an observable, tangible way? 
a temporal and spatial manifestation of God in some tangible form. How do you do that without drifting towards idolatry? This is a great challenge. Because we really can't do precisely what employ the same types of dynamics and experiential learning and participation that grabs us and brings the past forward into our lives as we do on Pesach and Shavuot and Sukkot. So how do we do this? Well, in a number of different ways. And my suggestion this afternoon is that given the transcendent nature of Sinai experience, we bring the moment forward into our lives cognizant of the danger and the challenge, avoiding any drift towards idolatry, because what we do is we enter into what I would call, um, well, for you visual types, I call the penumbra, the shadow, the edges, right? You can't look at the solar eclipse, but we can view the penumbra. Or perhaps a better way of thinking about this um, would, would, would be a, 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 as an echo, uh, a, a close parallel reflection of an idea a feeling, a style, or event, not, this, not a sound, because it'd be intimated that the sounds we make on Shavuot sound like Sinai, we're into, the, we're into the world of idolatry. But somehow, we participate, we do, we act, we join together in ways that reflect in parallel the idea, the feeling, dare I say, the style, the meaning, of the event. So let's take a look at a few of them uh, that I believe participate in this. And I'm drawing some of my commentary that's on the screen from Mishnah Brura. You know, that's the work of Rabbi Yisrael Meir Kagan, known as a Chafetz Chaim. And he has a wonderful commentary on the first section of Shulchan Aruch, which addresses the customs and the practices related not only to Shabbat, but also to the Chagim. So, so here's what, here's, and we know these. So let's sort of do them in sort of chronological order as we experience them on Shavuot. What do we have? We have the custom of Tikkun Leil Shavuot. Many in the sanctuary, and I'm sure countless numbers who are uh, on the live stream, have participated in such. We stay up late into the night, if not all night. Have you ever, have, and, and, we, and sometimes we even wonder, why are we doing this? Why are we here? Why at this particular hour? Why in this particular way? And I just love the Mishnah Baruch Ra's explanation. The reason for this menhag is because Israel slept all night before the giving of Torah, and they had to be awakened in order to receive the Torah. They had, they had to be roused from their slumber. So as not to sleep on the job, we study all night, and we are prepared, lest we miss the moment. So we stay up all night. And look in the middle, I love this, the Ari. Uh, Isaac Luria says that one shouldn't worry about losing sleep, because if you're engrossed in Torah learning, if you don't sleep, all the energy will be restored to you. So this uh, Saturday night, I expect to see you all at the, at the Tikkun. Therefore, we need now to stay up all night on Shavuos as a tikkun, as a preparation. Now, there's a wonderful tradition also that we don't see so much, but is an echo, I believe, of Bikurim. There's a tradition that says that when our ancestors camped out at Sinai, in the middle of the desert, the mountain bloomed turned green. Of course, this is an, this midrash, like so many, is an answer to a question. What's the question? How did our ancestors feed all those flocks while they're sitting around at the bottom of Sinai? Well, obviously, the 
Kodesh Baruch Hu made it green. It flourished, it flowered. Just a, a, another expression of the extraordinary nature of the event. And to me, this is an echo a little bit of, of the Bikurim. And what was the custom? In many congregations throughout the Jewish world, it was customary to bring greens to the synagogue on Shavuot until the rabbis prohibited it. Why? Look at the bottom. Because it became the, became the custom of the non-Jews to bring trees on their holidays. Guess which one? And I know which what you're thinking, but don't forget Palm Sunday, which is not so far removed, right, from the celebration of Shavuot. So they forbid it. Said, no, no. But you know us Jews. This is an 18th century, this is a painting of, uh, uh, by a, uh, a 19th century artist. His name is Oppenheim. He uh, lived from 1800 to 1882. And he is giving us a painting of what's going on in the synagogue on Shavuot. 19th century, German Jew. Two things to notice. Trees <laughs> everywhere. And the thing that struck me, if I may make an aside, is while Unfortunately, there are no women portrayed in this picture. Look at the diversity of dress. I, I find it intriguing that the artist presents the gathered congregation of Israel in the diversity of dress, which I take to represent diversity of communities, the different segments of the Jewish community, different places where Jews lived, all together, as, as the famous Midrash suggests, all standing together at Sinai with trees. Right down into pre-war Germany, this is a picture of the Neke Shavosheim synagogue, decorated Shavuot with trees. This is pre-World War II. Trees in the synagogue. In the places where the greenery where the prohibition on the greenery took hold, a different and beautiful custom arose. Paper cutting, artistic paper cuts. And what I'd like to, uh, like to point out um, is that these paper cuts were so closely associated with the observance of Shavuot that they had a special name. And when you give something a special name, because you have to name it, it's because it's happening, and it's widespread, and it's abundant. They're called shavusal, right? Pieces of sacred religious art, who says Jews don't do art? Brought to the synagogue, created, brought to the synagogue, again, almost as bikurim, on shavuot. Now, maybe a more familiar custom in, in most of our synagogues is that when we read our Seret HaDibrot, what we call in English the Ten Commandments, what we know as Jews are the Ten Pronouncements, what distinguishes them, if at all, is that they are what all Israel heard, according, as the Midrash says, according to each individual's capacity. If we read our Seret HaDibrot, and we stand. Just for those of us who are in the sanctuary, and I ask those of you who are uh, on the live stream to, to reflect as well, how many of us in our own synagogues participate in this custom? We do here at Beth Ami. How many learn to hear it, right? Okay, well, you know the Rambam forbid it. The Rambam spoke against it. In uh, his chuvot, uh, 263, I think, is the paragraph. He's asked about this custom, and he responds that it should be discontinued. And this is what he writes. For this causes a flaw in our belief, in the wrong conviction that there are different levels of the Torah, and that some parts are more lofty than others.
that if we stand for this part of the Torah and not for every other part of the Torah, that somehow these particular ten mitzvot are more important than the other 603. And to Rambam, this is a mistake. Every mitzvah, major or minor, and however we make those judgments, is equally significant, equally important, it e has equal spiritual and cosmic import. But even a Haredi source, Beis Yaakov, says that, eh, you can stand. And he justifies the custom by arguing that the special custom while reading the Ten Commandments on Shavuot it doesn't ascribe special status to the Ten Commandments if we only do so on the festival, which commemorates the giving of Torah for standing up on Shavuos is part of the commemoration and does not confer any special status on the Ten Commandments. So we stand not for the text, but we stand in an effort to capture the penumbra or the echo of the moment. Well, speaking of texts, like every Chag, Shavuos has a Haftorah. You have to have a Haftorah. What's the Haftorah for Shavuot? Ezekiel, very first chapter. Ezekiel's vision of the fiery ch of the chariot. Ezekiel's vision of the celestial abode. I look up and lo, a stormy wind came sweeping out of the north, a huge cloud and flashing fire surrounded by radiance in the center of it, in the center of the fire, a gleam as of amber. There are those who suggest that the, in the Hebrew and the, in the text and commentary, uh, that the language and the imagery of, of Ezekiel's uh, vision, his individual theophany as opposed to the public theophany of Sinai, but his individual theophany because there's no public anymore to have such an occasion. There's no place anymore to have such a gathering. So all that's left is the individual experience. His theophany is taken to be both in language and in, in portent an echo of that which we experience all of us at Sinai. And with all its, and you know it has such incredible complexity uh, 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 I'll use the word again, a, very, uh, a flood, a deluge of imageries folded together, all verge, verging, it's almost incomprehensible. And, and you know the, the, that the effort to, to, to parse out this vision gave rise to a whole school of, of uh, Kabbalah, the Merkava Kabbalah, the, the mysticism of the chariot. And it was not just us. Uh, this wonderful depiction of the wheel within the wheel within the wheel, which is part of, of Ezekiel's vision, is actually part of a fresco in a Baptist church in northern Macedonia. But, the, but I bring it to you because of the significance of the attempt to, to at one time abstract and also grasp that which is so transcendent and beyond our, our reach. And we know that the, that the, 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 the Kabbalah of Maaseh Merkava is, is a rich and deep effort to pull apart the language of Ezekiel in order, as the mystics would want, to gain insights and understandings uh, to the very nature and the essence of the divine. And also give, by the way, gave, gives rise to much uh, Jewish art for example, uh, you're familiar with uh, the artistic expressions, the attempt by Chagall to capture Ezekiel's vision. And again, the challenge, how, to, how do we depict this? How, how do we draw and describe the umbra? How do we capture the echo without crossing a very important line in our tradition? This is the, the attempt to capture the spiritual sublime but I have to also tell you that Ezekiel's vision has given some rise to some secular silliness. <laughs> Which gets revisited and repeated over and over on various cable stations that you may subscribe to. So we've been to the synagogue, we had our tikkun, We've heard the Torah, we've stood together, we've heard Ezekiel's vision and tried to understand what it means to us and for us 
as we try to recapture this day. Well, we have some other lovely customs. We eat dairy. Why? Why, Why dairy? Well, there is, again, from Mishnah Bura, a beautiful discussion. It's very simple. Because our ancestors at Sinai, having heard Torah, hadn't yet gone to kosher their kitchens. They hadn't, whatever meats they had, had not been properly shechted. So they couldn't eat meat yet. They had to eat dairy. I came across another beautiful explanation that didn't make it into a slide, but which I'd like to share. You know that there's a beautiful verse about how in the moment of revelation, how not a creature stirred, right? Not a sound was to be heard. That humanity, the human beings in the natural world, world stood together in a moment of awe and silent harmony and tranquility. And according to this drash, in remembrance and appreciation of that moment, that moment of unity and tranquility amongst all living things in the presence of the divine, we don't eat animals on that day. It's a beautiful drash. Well, not only dairy foods, but sweets. According to Mishnah Baruch, rather in some places, it's a custom to eat honey and milk because the Torah is likened to them, as it says in Shir HaShirim, like honey and milk under your tongue, are the words of Torah. And here's a lovely Torah cake. Well, I think actually it's for a bar mitzvah. But it's interesting that we draw this from Shir HaShirim. Remember, Shir HaShirim to the rabbis is what? Is the great analogy of the love between God and Israel. And Shavuot is then seen by extension as what? It's, it, it's the day of marriage. It's a wedding day. And Torah is the Ketubah. In fact, in Sephardi congregations, there's a tradition of reading what is called the Ketubah de la Ley, the marriage contract of the law where this theme of the marriage of God and Israel on Shavuot is a centerpiece of the ritual and celebration. Again, capturing another echo, another facet, another aspect uh, of, of Shavuot. And this is, is uh, an, Ital an Italian uh, ketubah of Shavuot it is, um, it's, 17, it's 18th century, the artist is unknown. I wanted you to see uh, especially who are the witnesses on this ketubah. The witnesses are Naaseh and Nishma. The witnesses are, I believe it's meant to be Aaron and opposite him Moshe. Again, capturing two different aspects of Shavuot, of, of of giving, the receiving of law, the giving of law, the receiving of law. And Aaron, what is Aaron going to do? Aaron is going to be the one who conducts the ritual. He's going to turn the, the teachings of Torah into, into ritual acts. And by the way, um, Aaron is also, you know, uh, is, is tribute in pure kavod is doing what? Is being the one who brings people closer to the teachings of Torah. So we have, we have the, this beautiful wedding theme, the sense that at Sinai, God and Israel are joined together. And what is the great theme? What is the great expression of this theme that is also read in the synagogue on Shavuot? What's the Megillah for Shavuot? It's the Book of Ruth. And what's happening in the Book of Ruth? Well, if you don't know, take a good look at this piece of art by Sholem of Sfat, the great Israeli artist and primitivist, uh, capturing all the different aspects of, Sh of Shavuot, of, of the Book of Ruth. But what happens in, in the Book of Ruth? It, it, she follows her uh, Israelite mother-in-law, Naomi, this Moabite woman. She 
promises, she makes a sort of a non seven nishma promise, where you will go, I will go, where you lodge, I will lodge, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. And what does she do then? Then she goes into the land of Israel and she asserts the teachings of the Torah, the rights of the poor to glean the leftovers of the barley harvest. She confronts Boaz and challenges him to fulfill his obligation of leveret marriage, right? And this is, the, we read the book of, uh, of, of Ruth and the, the Midrash on Ruth, the very first chapter of the Midrash on Ruth uh, is, uh, focuses, in fact, on the giving of the Torah, on Matan Torah, uh, and the association uh, between Ruth and uh, the Matan Torah is already found in Talmudic sources in uh, Tractate Sfarim. So here we, so we, here we have it, that we read Ruth, why? Because Ruth's whole narrative is in its, in its nature an echo, an echo of our people's experience at Sinai. We too were wanderers, we too committed ourselves, we too followed hopefully as faithfully as Ruth does. And you also know that, there, as I mentioned earlier, there, the book of Ruth ends with uh, the genealogy where Ruth is the forebearer of King David. And again, King David is there's a strong association between King David and uh, Shavuot. Uh, so, so we can say about, we, we, model, we, we look to Ruth as a model, because she could say, you know, I've been there, done that, and got the sweatshirt. <laughs> um, I'd like to turn now, as I conclude my presentation, uh, to something very personal. And, and what I like to believe, and how I answer this question, the challenge of Shavuot. How do we bring Shavuot, this sui generis moment in the past, which has no parallel, has no connection, and really can't be brought present in the way we bring other moments in the spiritual history of our folk present? How, how, how do we do this? Now, there is a verse in the narrative, Vayotse Moshe et Ha'am, Moses leads the people out of the camp towards God, and they took their place, the Tachti Tahar. And Rashi says that according, and relying on the Chilta de Rabbi Yishmael, and, and on Shabbat, uh, Tractate Shabbat, Daf 80, uh, 88, he says, according to its literal meaning, this signifies at the foot of the mountain, but a Midrashic explanation is that the mountain was plucked up from its place and was arched over them, over the people of Israel as a cask, higigit, we'll see that in a second, so that they were standing beneath under the mountain itself. This is called the coerced Torah, or the coerced covenant, which, it, by the way, is a theme of Midrashic and Agadic conversation, which is worthy of a presentation of itself. Only the hint of the question is, why in, why? Why does Rabbi Av, uh, Avidimi ben Chama ben Chas, Chasa say at all that this teaches that the Holy One, blessed be he, turned the mountain over them like a tub, kagigit, and for those of you who know Hebrew, you also see the word gog, like a ceiling, a roof over their heads, and say to them, if you accept the Torah, well and good, but if not, here will be your burial. What prompts such a midrash? What was he thinking? What was he trying to convey? What, what conversation was he trying to encourage and initiate? And that's a whole other presentation. I hope to be invited. <laughs> but I would like to offer another way of understanding this. And I'd like to do it in a nice rabbinic fashion by comparing texts. It 
Abraham looked up, his eyes fell upon a ram caught in a thicket by its horn. So Abraham went, took the ram, and offered it up as a burnt offering in place of his son. Tachat, no. Rashi has a wonderful comment about what this means. And you'll forgive me, but I'm going to read it. Since it is written, he offered it up as for a burnt offering, surely nothing is missing in the text. What then is the force of instead of his son? What does this mean? At every sacrificial act, and for those of us who, of you who have studied with me over the years, the Akedah, over the last 35 years, maybe we've hit it three times as we've read through the Torah and, and studied. Think about this for the next time we come back to Bereshit. At every sacrificial act, he, meaning Abraham, performed on it, meaning the ram. He prayed, saying, may it be thy will that this act, almost like he named Muhanu Muzuman, may it be your will that this act may be regarded as having been done to my son, as though my son is being slain, as though his blood is being sprinkled, as though his skin were being flayed, as though he is being burnt and is being reduced to ashes. Tachat beno. The ram is offered up in place of Isaac. And not only is in this, in this Isaac is the, the ram is Isaac, Isaac is the ram. There's this conflation. Very, very powerful. And so I like, here's my challenge. Here's my, here's my drosh here. But tachat and tachat, at the foot of or instead of. Our ancestors stood betachti tahar. They stood at the foot of the mountain or under it. We can talk about that another time. But we, the Jewish people, in all our diversity, we stand tachat. We stand in place of the mountain. And that's how we bring it forward. That's how we capture a glimpse of the penumbra of Sinai. That's how we hear with our hearts and our souls, not our ears. We hear the echo of the moment of revelation. Sinai is a singular moment not to be duplicated or even reenacted. It remains in the past to be brought forward into the present by each generation of the people who carry physically and spiritually the record of that moment and its instruction to us, its Torah, be carried into the world. The Torah is given, the rabbis say, in 70 languages. It's to be made accessible. How does Torah become accessible? It becomes accessible to the world by how we live. We become the dugama. We become the living examples of Torah. The, and so the rabbis say, if it's given in 70 languages, Torah has 70 faces. It has, and 70 being a, meaning a myriad, not just seven zero. Countless aspects and is to be understood in many complementary ways so that all are included, so that we are complements, not competition. The Bratslaver said, kol neshama ot b'Torah, that everyone, every soul is like a letter in the Torah. Everyone is to be included. A Torah without an ot, a particular letter, is incomplete. The people of Israel, the body of Israel is incomplete without everyone being counted, everyone being included. And everyone, I believe, and I believe Avi lived this, that, Avi, that, Avi, that everyone has an oat, that everyone has a little something to share, a little something to teach that is unique to them. And taking another meaning of the Hebrew word, that each of us is an oat, each of us is a sign and symbol of Torah in the world. Each of us, by virtue of being B'Tselem Elohim, is a sign and symbol, a penumbra 
or an echo, if you like, of the moment at Sinai when God was present in the world. As I said, that uh, we all stood together at Sinai, all the generations of, of Israel, all the prophets, all the rabbis to come, all of us, we were there. And I believe it, it was Avi who taught us the importance of standing with our differences in our diversity, not in conformity, but in unity. He taught us the importance of that Psalm, the verse from Psalms with which we started, how important it is Shevet Achim Va'achot Gam Yachad, that we should be standing together, learning together, living together, loving each other, now as at Sinai. It is not some ceremony, this Shavuot of commemoration that we celebrate. This is Samson Raphael Hirsch, the seminal thinker of modern orthodoxy but an opportunity to grow ever more deserving of and committed to Torah. Let us make that so this Shavuot, and we do it in the name and in the memory of our beloved family member, friend and teacher, Avi West. Let's have, if we have a few moments for comments, questions, uh, I'll be happy to do that. And as I said, I would like to leave a few minutes at the very end so that together we may recite Kaddish to Rabbanan. So we have a few minutes for questions. Um, one, I don't know if uh, the live stream can hear me if I can write. Um, if, so the, if anybody has a question, feel free to, to hand, 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 hand me the note card. Do, do, we, get, do we get any off, off the live stream? I, I have a couple, a couple of questions. Okay, good. Good. So um, first, um, some people are wondering if there's differences between uh, denominations in Judaism, if you want to have any commentary on um, maybe between Reform, Reconstructionist, Orthodox, in what, if, you, if you're not comfortable with it, we can, we can move on, but if you had some, some thoughts on, well, I, on that. I, I, I can't, um, since I don't daven at every shul, <laughs> uh, and that's, by the way, one of the disadvantages of being a pulpit rabbi, you can't, be part of the kahila, this place, that place, or the other place, you are in your own place. And so only that can I comment on. One of the ways I think that uh, we in the, historically in the reform movement have sought to do um, what I have suggested, and that is try to enter into the penumbra or catch the echoes of, of Sinai on Shavuot. Um, we have associated Chag HaShavuot uh, and Matan Torah with a confirmation, uh, a celebration of the continued education of our young people beyond bar and bat mitzvah. Off, uh, and in many synagogues, uh, the lang our congregation as well, in many reformed congregations, the language of this celebration is linked with uh, bikurim. We, we see that the, the t and how many of the, the congregations, the young people offer teachings to the congregation that this is a biku, this, these are bikurim, this is the first fruits of their more adult Jewish learning that they're sharing. I know that in many congregations it was customary for confirmants to enter the sanctuary carrying greens or flowers, uh, as we saw in, in other places and in other times. Uh, and uh, and I, and here at Beth Ami, in the spirit of Matan Torah, we gift each of our, our, our confirmants with a Tanakh. So we, we try to tie this together. I don't think that our practice is uh, unique in our movement. And I, at the same time, I'm sure that there are other beautiful and compelling uh, rituals in other Reformed congregations. I grew up in a conservative congregation in suburban North Jersey, where we also celebrated <laughs> confirmation on Shavuot. Uh, so that this custom is not unique to the reform movement, but it became a centerpiece for us as we tr tried to build shvu uh, Shavuot in into a meaningful co communal celebration with the penumbra and the echoes of antiquity. Great, um, thank, you, thank you for that answer. And I have, I have another here from uh, the in-person audience. 
in, your, in the images of the paper cuts, there were animals in both of them. And so the, the question is if that um, represents a burnt offering. I, I don't know, you know, this is very interesting. They, they, they're like gazelles, and I think even in one there's a unicorn. Uh, so I, I and, and again, we have to remember that we are um, circum, we're, we're proscribed from creating images of anything living, you know, you know. So I, I think that they're fanciful, and I don't, uh, personally, I haven't drawn that conclusion. Though th there may be, there may be good reason to do so, I'm not sure that there's a direct relationship. Great, thank, thank you. I think this is a, a, good, a good moment for you to be able to, to finish you know, your presentation, but I also wanna to thank you again um, for this great, amazing presentation. I'm sure everyone here and, and everyone online, I'm not even sure if I'm in the screen or not, but everyone online um, has a lot to take from this as we go into Shavuot this, uh, this weekend and, and so much to learn. And um, uh, I appreciate you being here and, uh, and thank you all for joining us both online and in person. I wanna make one, one more little pitch for our day of learning, our alternative day of learning that's coming up um, in a couple of weeks. Um, earlier in the presentation, Maimonides was mentioned, the Rambam, and uh, one of his sort of, not necessarily, this isn't necessarily one of his controversies, that's what the, the, the class will talk about in a couple of weeks, but it mentions some of his conflicting views um, with the Jewish community. So if you're more interested to learn about um, Maimonides and sort of his views versus other sources in Judaism, it's, it'll, it should be a very interesting uh, two, uh, two session class in uh, Sunday, uh, June 12th. So. And uh, so thank you all again, and uh, thank you. And as I mentioned, I think it was appropriate for us to start with uh, the bracha la sofa divrei Torah. And I think it's equally appropriate, uh, given the nature of our study and uh, the blessed memory of the one who, in whose honor we have learned together today, uh, that we conclude with Kaddish to Rabbanan. My uh, apologies. Uh, again, the limitations of my PowerPoint art uh, has provided us with the Aramaic and a translation, but not a transliteration. Uh, I invite those of you who are here in the sanctuary with me who are able and inclined to rise for Kaddish to Rabbanan. I make the same uh, offer to those of you who are with us on the live stream. Uh, if you are able and inclined to stand for this recitation, and in this way, perhaps, whether we're here or there, uh, we can be joined together in remembering and giving honor. Yit gadal v'yit kadash shemei rabah, ba'alma divra chirute v'yamlich machute, v'chayechon v'yomechon v'chaye d'chol beit Yisrael, v'agala v'zman kari v'imru, amen. Kehesh me rabba mevarach, lolam ulolme omaya. Yit barach, vi yishtabach, vi yit paar, vi yit romon, vi yit nase. Vi yit hadar, vi yit halev, vi yit halal, shame de kutcha verihu. La ela min ko virchata vishirata, tush bechata venechemata da amiron ba alma, vimru ame. Al Yisrael, ba al rabbanan, the al tami dehon, the al kol tami de tami dehon, the al kol manda oskin ba oraita, diva atra kadisha hadain, the diva kol atar va atar, ye he lahon lahon shalama, raba, hina ve hizda, va rahamin va hayin va arihin, umosne rivihe upur kana. Min kadam avahon di vishamaya, ve ar avim ru, amen. Yehe shalom araba min shamaya, ve chayim tovim, ve kol Yisrael, vim ru, amen. O se shalom vim romav, hu ya se shalom, alenu ve al kol Yisrael, ve al kol yoshve tevel, vim ru, amen. Thank you for the privilege of teaching in Avi's memory. Chag Sameach.